we thank you for being punctual and allowing us to stay pretty much on schedule. So uh, an opportunity to now hear from the two rapporteurs on what you said in your particular group so that we get the feedback from each of the two groups. So Jill will lead off. Dr. Fendice has many years experience in Africa and is now leading uh, agricultural economics, ag education, rural sociology, and agricultural journalism at the University of Missouri. Thank you, Ken, and, and uh, um, I'm delighted to be here to uh, just summarize some of what we heard today uh, for the groups. And we had two great presentations. Uh, Keith Moore started, and then we had Rebecca Nelson, and they really got us thinking about uh, a lot of different ideas uh, that made us stretch. And so I put together a couple of PowerPoints that were based upon the discussion that happened afterwards. And I apologize to anybody right up front whose um, specific point I left out. So if we have a minute right afterwards for anybody that wants to contribute that point, I think it'd be useful. Okay, um, this is what I heard, and one, one in terms of reflecting on it as well as summarizing what I heard. Uh, today we have a lot of discussion about the idea of science communication. You hear, hear AAAS and other groups talking about communicating science to the public. But what we have today here is also this two-way communication going on, and it's not only communication, it's also about listening. So several of our groups brought up about the listening issue uh, and how we can listen and listen well uh, for these for uh, what we're talking about in terms of topic. Um, early so listening and translation. Early integration of voice came up as one of the important topics, and it re was reflected from this morning's topic. And whose voice? Uh, and that came up at several tables in terms of power structures and hearing from others outside of the dominant power structure. Um, questions, okay, so how are we going to broaden that voice? How are we going to get down under dominant power structures that might be the participators in our research? And questions came up in presentations, and Rebecca's presentations dealt, dealt a presentation dealt a little bit with the IT platform. How can we utilize the IT platform better than we've done? And I put up some topics: crowdsourcing, knowledge sharing, um, idea visualization, uh, data visualization, best practices. How? What do we know? How can we do that? How can we do it faster? How can we do it in the next? in the next couple of years um, to really uh, address these kinds of topics. Um, we also talked about not only listening to the field, but also uh, breaking down barriers among us. And uh, uh, how do we talk as disciplines, and how do we listen as disciplines? And I think that's a very important topic at this point. It did come up in our discussions um, around our tables. Breaking down barriers between researchers, MSU gave us a, a hint and said, uh, carry big stick. So I bring that big stick, okay, to be able to bring that down. But I think we're really talking again about listening and also um, translating. And in those early stages of that collaboration, there's a lot of translating that goes on. But later on, it's also that listening, that very careful listening that goes on um, between people that are trying to solve a problem. We also talked across the tables. It come, came up across a number of the tables about power dynamics. Um, and uh, the question of seeing more participation among women came up. Um, there was the dominant structure talked about, but then women and talking about children that came up in the earlier presentations by Re uh, presentation by Regina, and how do we go about doing that? I'm still seeing in a lot of pictures that I see mostly men in the pictures, uh, and um, but now we're starting to see more and more inclusion of the voice of women, and that came up today as a um, as a sense of we're making progress. 
A focus on youth critical, and I think most of us agree with that concept. Um, I don't think we've gotten there yet. Um, and how do we go about doing that? And that came up from one of our tables, and um, it, it was very much emphasized, and I think in our thinking it's emphasized as well. Then also, in terms of power dynamics, and this goes to the university, and it may not have been intended from the university's perspective, but the idea of metrics for measuring impacts. How do we go about measuring impacts? So it's not only at the university level, um, but also as we go farther out into the field, and what do we mean by real impact or the impacts of our work as we start listening to each other? Then I think there were a number of ideas, and these were across the tables, uh, to explore and operationalize. And these, to me, are always fun. In other words, places when you come to a conference, or ideas when you come to a conference, and you start to hear different ideas that you go, oh, if we could only do that. And one was the provision of choice. And the idea of an information market. Uh, and that came up in the presentation that Rebecca did. And uh, how, do we do, how do we do that? And that, that, uh, that question was raised by at least one of the tables as we went around the room. Another was just-in-time research. How do we do that if we bring the kinds of ideas that we're talking about up to the front end and then we have quite a long timeline for some of the science research to take place, how are we doing that continually throughout the process and speeding it up but also making it just in time? So we're talking about processes and that was, that was I think, interesting to all of us. Uh, continuous use of indigenous knowledge. And in fact, I'm, I'm surprised that word hadn't come up earlier in the conference because there's such an interest in indigenous knowledge um, groups across the United States, and, uh, but it did come up in the group conversations. And then appropriate scaling. And it was brought up in terms of human capacity, building, policy, et cetera. And there were a number of different bullet points under that particular aspect of it that uh, were important. My last slide, just a couple of uh, reminders that came out of our discussions after the presentations. One was one size doesn't fit all, and obviously if you had, there's never a situation where you have only one voice, there are multiple voices, there's choice that goes into development, and that's the way we live today. And also we need to learn to crawl or walk before we can run. In other words, we have to be listening on the ground, understand the dynamics of on the ground before we can take it forward. Now, on each of my slides, I've included one particular photo that was important to me, okay? And I actually didn't realize it until today. Uh, this is a picture in Mozambique of orange flesh sweet potato. And it was in the field in a place where I had not seen it ever before when I was there in May. And I was going to send it to Regina. And as I started to put it up there, uh, I, and, and these are everywhere, everywhere in the villages in, in Munhinga in central Mozambique. As I put it up there, the picture, as you know, came up large. And I saw the people, you can barely see them on the side, I saw those people sitting there. And they would have told us a lot. We didn't do that. We made a mistake. We went by, I took a picture, we moved on. It really was a moment we could have utilized, and I hope we utilize those moments. Thanks. Other, yeah, before you start, any other points that I missed? Any points I missed from the group? Okay. Patty from the World, for, Ag, World Forestry Center and Agroforestry Center and Research into Action. Thank you. Thanks. So we had a great group of people. Um, uh, Ruth and uh, Jerry really gave us a lot of food for thought and we had quite a wide ranging conversation. So it was a challenge to summarize it. But 
I have to say that in, in trying to think of some organizing principles to, to give the feedback, I'm calling this challenges and opportunities for translational research. And I've been leading a research program uh, that involved all 15 of the CGIR centers for the last five years, and I've called it linking knowledge with action. And it's not knowledge to action because it's a two-way thing. And I, I want to make sure that action is informing the knowledge in, in both ways. And when you do the knowledge to action, we're, we're falling back into that pipeline route, that there's some brilliant people coming up with great ideas, and then it's just about translating it and getting out there. And in the CG in particular, we've been trying to flip it on its edge and really think about how we do research in a fundamentally different way than we have been uh, so that we will have more impact on sustainable poverty alleviation, et cetera. And so the, the, the topic of this conversation, I, I, of this um, conference, is, is a big one. And, and I'm really, really happy that this conversation is happening now across universities and other places where I haven't seen it happening so, so much, although there's a new area called sustainability science in many places, which is really trying to do this. And Bill Clark, uh, a group at, at um, Harvard, has actually was one of my first exposures to really thinking about this and how we can call it a research area in of itself. Um, because we don't know how to do this. If we knew how to do it, it would just be about process. But we don't know, uh, and we, it, it's still a researchable issue. So the four things I came up with from the conversations in our group were, number one, institutions matter. They matter a lot. And when you talk about institutions, it's the rules of the game. Um, and when the rules of the game don't support translational research, we have a, we have a continuing challenge. And these are the institutional rules of uh, research organizations, of the funding organizations, and it's not just the institutions that we work with in the de developing world, it's their capacity also. If you think we're struggling with it in, in the international ag research area, you know, how is Akari or, or other people um, dealing with this? Um, so it, it does matter. Um, I got struck by your sticks and carrots um, because it's been a, a, a debate within my own um, group. Um, some management types like the stick approach more than the carrot approach, but I actually think it's all about the carrots. And it's about the incentives, which is the institutions <laughs> and the rules of the game, right? So you keep coming back to that. One of the things that shifted in the CG recently is the shift to open access. And I'm not sure if anyone's appreciating how big an incentive shift that is. Where, you know, we can bring together people from very diverse organizations and say, actually, what we're developing together is going to be shared with the world. And even if it's just this little thing and you go and write your paper for your university or write a policy brief for your uh, NGO or whatever, uh, what we are creating and the data we're collecting and the new knowledge we're generating is we're sharing it with the world. And young students all over the place are going to get access to it that never had access to it before. And so I, I think that's a, a huge one. Translational research takes time. Um, and, and it comes up in, in very many ways. And creating those spaces for diverse actors to come together and co-create solutions to local problems, these communities of practice that Corinne has so eloquently talked about, I really like that idea of calling them, we, we've been calling them in the linking knowledge to action field um, safe spaces. Because what you want to do is Get people away from their own incentives. Bring them together in a space where they have freedom to create. They can go back to their you know, incentives and rewards, but when they're co-creating together, you've given them freedom to be creative and do things in a very different way. And the M&E frameworks, the log frames, and all these things that we all have to deal with when we write a proposal or try to fund research don't create that space. They can hinder it. So again, we're talking about big changes. Um, so on a, a more positive note, we've learned a lot. And, and, and this came out in, in our group. Um, we talk about the, the K2A principles in, in, uh, in my world. And they are based on the foundations of capacity, communication, and partnership through thoughtful engagement processes. And I, call, I talk about structured, well-facilitated uh, processes are absolutely key. Because you don't just bring people together and, and hope they have a good party in the middle. 
you have to really structure it. And by structuring it, you enable them to be creative. The structure actually enables creativity. And we've learned a lot about that. So this co-development of the metrics of success, which is another topic that kept coming up. How do we know that we're succeeding? And, and by doing this little case study here, and this little case study here, and this little case study, and even maybe bringing those together, we're not creating the, the, the powerful evidence that a lot of people are asking for. So we've got in, in, in uh, the climate change um, social learning initiative that's just been started by a program called CCAFs that I've been with. We've, we, are, we are crowdsourcing uh, projects that have been taking translation, translational research approaches, if you will, and we're trying to bring together hundreds of them and, and crowdsourcing them so we're not cherry picking because we get accused of cherry picking when we do the evaluation in the other way. Um, crowdsource a whole bunch of projects. What we've created is a framework for evaluating the success of these projects. And we're asking people to, to, to apply this same framework. You're still going to have your specifics for your project, specific to your whatever the project's about. But by trying to create a framework uh, and bring in these hundreds of case studies, we're trying to build up the evidence over the next five to ten years. And we're trying to use social learning principles and social media and crowdsourcing as the, as the um, organizing principle. So I think that's the kind of exciting new thing that we've got to start thinking about in the research world. Okay, um, which brings me to the last point, which I, talked to, uh, I call sort of the scaling. How, how is the scaling issue and, and the, how do we get leverage? Because we can always have these wonderful projects where you've been working with communities in a particular place for five or ten years and, and we're telling that story quite eloquently. But of course that's not what we're being asked to do. We're being asked to how do you do that much more broadly and widely and, and, and reach so many more people. Well I think the ICT um, uh, approach is, is something to really think about and by b thinking about communication and including communication specialists from the beginning not later which we often do as scientists thinking about this social learning in a really much more structured way than we have how do we use cell phones radios TV social media to think about right from the beginning in any kind of project or program we go forward with, with um, to, to do that inclusive, empowering stuff that we want to do. <laughs> stuff. So I really want to thank uh, you guys because this has helped me start to, to think about, this has been a paper in my head for five years. Do you guys have that, that paper you never get to, to, to writing? <laughs> Um, and this is helping me to, to come up with, and so if you guys have any other suggestions for me on the, the, the organizing principles of this paper, because what we're doing here is just, it really is the cutting edge. Someone said to me that once, you know, Patty, this isn't rocket science, and, and they said, it's, it's the new science. And um, I thought that was pretty cool. So thank you. <laughs> We do have time for one or two clarifying questions if you have them for Jill or Patty. Great summary. Yes, Bill. talk about extension from, and we talk about outreach to, but I think your point was it's engagement with. Changing the preposition can make a big difference. Another comment or question? Yes, Jeff. She's coming. <coughs> On, on the general topic of scaling, I wonder if there's been any thought in terms of uh, putting ourselves out of business, in terms of, uh, or altering our, our role and looking ahead 10 or 20 years. Do we really want to have uh, outside experts uh, guiding the research in, you know, 
in the, in the countries that we're working in now, shouldn't we be looking at developing s institutions and systems that begin to take on these roles and, in a sense, put ourselves out of business? Now, there still might be a role, for example, in the CG in terms of germplasm maintenance and addressing regional problems that go across national borders and so on. But it, it seems to me, you know, when we're talking about scaling, ultimately, a lot of these uh, efforts have to be done by the nations themselves, and so can we help enable that process and, in essence, put ourselves out of business in 10 or 20 years? Response? I couldn't agree more. Um, I always, actually, when I entered the CG over 20 years ago, I said uh, the, the, the sign of my success will be that I, I'm just absolutely not needed. Uh, anymore. And what is this white blonde woman from Canada coming in, you know, living in Africa? And just doesn't make sense at some levels, does it? So I think what, what, what you're talking about is actually a challenge for everyone in the room in the, in the academic community. So how do we do the training and capacity um, programs in a different way also? Um, and I think a lot of you are struggling with that. And I'm sure looking at the MOOCs and, and, and other ways because I, I just think but you know, you don't just put it on the web and it's, you know, it's, it's learned and taken up. It's not that easy. So it's a little bit about the open access, but it's a lot about targeting the needs, their specific needs, and, and, and really thinking again. And it's a communication challenge. It, it's a big one. Um, so I think, I think we all should be challenged in this room to be thinking about that. And absolutely, we should be obsolete <laughs> in another 10 or 20 years, let's hope. Obsolete, well put. I, I can't agree more. Um, it, it would be fabulous. That, to me, is what capacity building is about. It's enabling. And uh, if we can be out of business, fabulous. Thanks, Jeff. We don't have time for more questions, but uh, the discussion can continue. And thank the two of you for really summarizing very well. Now moving into our, further into our afternoon schedule, uh, Dr. Ambassador uh, Siddiqui is here to be the moderator for this short session before we go back into some discussions, but uh, we're certainly happy to have you here, Islam. Thank you, Ken. Thank you for this exciting and fascinating discussion so far. I know we have not allowed uh, questions, but I think the good thing about this session is, since we have only one speaker, uh, you'll have an opportunity to ask more questions and continue the discussion we had. Of course, this morning, Joanna Nestle, and as well as Drs. Deaton, Valdivia, and Ellers, um, as well as uh, Dr. Kapinga, were instrumental in getting the discussion going, and I think I would like to continue as we shift gears into the discussion, which is how funders, researchers, NGOs, and smallholders create mutual opportunities and sustainable outcomes. Building partnerships is not new to CSIS. Every day, we at this CIS continue to build partnerships and the importance of collaboration across sectors institutions and areas of expertise are a common day occurrence and this keeps on happening and that's what we pride as a core strength of CSIS. During my tenure in the Obama administration and before that in the Clinton administration, I have continued to benefit in my role as by, in engaging in negotiations bilaterally, regionally and multilaterally on agricultural trade issues. I think Dr. Moore brought the point which I was going to make and I want to reinforce. In order to reach sustainable outcomes and agreements, you have to engage in negotiations. You then also face resistance from the stakeholders and the, and the partners, in my case, trading partners. And then how do you build the chemistry to reach agreements? And this is what I found in my work over the past 18 plus years in Washington, D.C., how do you reach mutual and sustainable agreements in terms of reaching outcomes which will be sustainable for in the long run? So sustainable solutions to for food insecurity across the public 
and private sectors, as well as non-government institutions and organizations and smallholder farmers and entrepreneurs can be leveraged to harness inclusive opportunities and sustainable outcomes across the world and both in nations which are developing as well as developed. Joining us today is Dr. Sahara Moon Chaputin, the Acting Division Chief for Agriculture Research at the U.S. Agency for International Development. She joined the agency in 2006 as biotechnology advisor, managing international partnerships to promote the adoption of genetically modified uh, products as well as conservation agriculture practices in South Asia, as well as develop bioengineered crops for smallholder farmers and strengthen biosafety regulatory capacities throughout Africa and Asia. Prior to joining USAID, Dr. Chaputin worked with the Biosafety Institute for Genetically Modified Agriculture Products, or Big Map for short, at the Iowa State University where her work focused on resolving regulatory issues for genetically modified crops, especially those intended for small and niche markets. Dr. Shepardin holds a BS degree in biology from Stanford University and PhD degree in physiology from the Harvard University. And she's also a triple AS science and technology policy fellow. So she will be speaking this afternoon on achieving meaningful smallholder participation for meaningful knowledge. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Chaputin to the podium. Well, thank you. Thanks a lot. It's great to be here. Um, this is, I'm sorry to have missed the morning session, so I was pleased to get the, the two little recaps that we just got. Um, how do I how do I work the slides? I can't actually see. Okay, sorry. So I can't see the slides from up here, right? Okay. Down there. The one on the left. And how do I get it started? Cool. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for that. And um, so I'm from the U.S. Agency for International Development. I'm going to be, actually, it sounds like a lot of the, what I'll be talking about are some themes you might have already touched on this morning. So particularly um, the, the point on, on how we engage women when we're thinking about smallholders, how we engage women in particular in the agricultural enterprise is something I'll be talking about. Um, but I'm generally going to be talking about how we work with smallholder farmers, how we work for smallholder farmers through a range of different models. Um, through our work at USAID on agriculture and food security. My, my primary responsibility at USAID is in the research division, but I'll be trying to pull in some examples from across the agency as well. But I will, I think it, research is of interest to this audience, so I'll be drawing on, on examples from research quite a bit. Um, one of these buttons will do it, right? So I probably don't need to restate the global challenge. I imagine all of you are familiar with this, but we are um, trying to address the fact that, uh, you know, many people across the world, around over 800 million people still suffer from chronic hunger. Um, the world's population, of course, is still growing. Food, food product production will need to increase. Um, throughout all this, we're facing the uncertainty of climate change and the fact that resources 
are, are, being, are scarce, whether it's land, water, labor, you name it, we're basically having to do more with less. Um, the global food price spike of 2008 was really the, the genesis of the U.S. government's current response to, to, global, to addressing global hunger and, and food security. And what came out of this was the Feed the Future initiative. That's a whole of government initiative. It pulls in not just USAID, who leads the initiative, but of course other agencies throughout the U.S. government, in particular the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And, and basically this is renewing the U.S. government's commitment to reducing hunger and poverty around the world. And we're really working with partner countries to help them to combat hunger and undernutrition. And as I mentioned, it's a, it's a whole of government. It was it's initiated as a presidential initiative. And, and it really has at its root a focus on, a, on it being a long-term effort, not just to get in and out really quick, but to really do the long-term work that's required to sustainably transform agricultural systems and to, to feed people. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about how we focus on smallholders and how we focus on women through this initiative. Both of these are really at the heart of the initiative. And I'm gonna pull on different examples from our programs about how we get impact in the field through the impact pathways, many of which start with research, but go all throughout the value chain into the field. So why do we, why do we work with smallholders? Um, really the evidence suggests that the evidence demonstrates that investments in smallholder agriculture can have a huge impact on overall poverty reduction, and that those, impact, those investments in agriculture and the impacts you can get from that, that can be quite a bit greater than, than in many other sectors in development. 75% um, of the poor, the world's poor, live in rural areas, so right there you can see why you need to, you need to ground your efforts in, in agricultural and rural areas. Um, when you invest in smallholder ag-led development, you're creating rural income growth and employment linkages. And, and there's evidence that small farms can be even more productive than large farms. So really by investing in smallholders and their small farms, which can have very efficient use of resources, you can really both increase food production, but also get those increases in smallholder incomes that are gonna to lead to the broader rural income growth that we're looking for. So this, this initiative is not just about, I mean, it's, at its heart, it's a food security initiative, but it's about both feeding people and really using the agricultural enterprise to transform um, economies in developing countries. And, and in fact, just a, a little data point here, smallholder agriculture has been shown to be 3.2 times more effective at reducing extreme poverty than investments in other sectors. And then why do we invest in women? I probably don't need to um, explain that to this crowd. It's recognized, I think, throughout development that, that women are particularly important, but in agriculture, that's, that's especially so. And gender analysis underlies everything we do within Feed the Future. Um, we recognize that women are a large part of the labor force, up to 50% in many parts of Africa. They often will have limited la access to land, to technologies, to inputs, credit, and this makes it difficult for them to be productive on their farms. And when you can advance the status of women, you can increase agricultural productivity overall because you're giving women more access to these things. Um, poverty can be reduced, and you can increase nutrition. Um, and it's been estimated that if women had the same access to assets as men, you could, you could increase farm yields by 20 to 30 percent. And that's, that's pretty major if you think that um, perhaps half of the smallholders are women and then you're increasing that by 20 to 30 percent, you could make some, some major gains. So not just in our field work do we think about how we can engage women, not just when we're out there directly working with smallholders, but in everything we do, and, and from the research side of things, that represents a challenge. We have to think about if we're funding and we're supporting, say, a project that's fairly upstream, thinking about genomics for a crop, how do you think about women and the impacts that's going to have on women and the relevance of your research to women when you're working with a bunch of scientists back in a lab somewhere who are doing sequencing? That's something we're still working on. We're trying to think through, and I'll show, I'll show you some examples about how we do bring that gender analysis into the work we do. And, and I won't say that we've got it all figured out, certainly across Feed the Future, this is, um, this is sort of a learning in progress. We're really trying to understand how we can better engage with and work with and for women in, in everything we do. So I, I mentioned research. I'm gonna switch uh, just for a moment and tell you a little bit about our research strategy because I think that will be of interest. It, it was launched in 2011, the Feed the Future Research Strategy, and it came out of a year-long consultation process with, with many of you, I know, with the U.S. university community, the international research community, the NGOs, the private sector, other stakeholders. And, and um, 
Basically, it addresses global priorities. The, the Feed the Future initiative is anchored in focus countries, 19 focus countries around the world. But within the research strategy, we've taken a global look to try to see what are the global challenges that are, that are facing agriculture and how can we bring central resources to bear on those challenges? What kind of research should be prioritized in order to really advance agriculture around the world? And through our research strategy, we're ensuring a pipeline of innovation, of knowledge, of technologies, of capacity building that really can underlie the entire initiative. So to get there, we started with a series of analyses. We, we, did, we started with overlaying some spatial analyses, thinking about how the prevalence of poverty lines up with the number where, where the poor people are in the world. Um, we overlaid that with analysis of where you have the most stunted children in the world. And here I'll just say that um, Feed the Future is not just an agricultural growth program, but as I said, it's, it's a, the food security component is extraordinarily important. And a very important component of food security is nutrition security. That's, that's part of food security. And so we would not be effective if we were not taking into account ensuring nutritional outcomes for the smallholders and the populations we're working with. So it's this, it's this overlay of poverty and, and undernutrition with where in the world you have the productive agricultural systems that you really could transform through the right kinds of investments. And that's where we came out with, with our Feed the Future research strategy, essentially. It was anchored in these key geographies where we, there are many, many smallholders. There's a high prevalence of poverty, of undernutrition, of stunting, and where there's really the potential to have incredible agricultural growth. So the Indo-Gangetic Plains in South Asia is a major focus for us, and three systems in Africa, the Sudano-Sahelian systems in West Africa, the Maize Mix systems in Ethan Southern Africa, and the Ethiopian Highlands. And then on top of that, the prioritization process for our research came out as we have some longer term research priorities, really thinking about advancing the productivity frontier in both crops and animals, looking at, at climate resilience and looking at diseases and pests. We want to really think about how we can transform these agricultural systems, and that requires a research agenda of its own, thinking not just how you bring in inputs into a system, but how you can transform how that system works. And then finally, we wanted to really focus on improving nutrition and food safety. So now I'm going to shift to going into some examples about how we work with smallholders. I'm going to pull both from our research programs, but also through some recently launched scaling activities that are just getting off the ground, where we're really bringing the outputs of the research and trying to think about how we can scale those to many, many more farmers um, than, than previously we might have reached. But before I do that, I just want to kind of highlight the Feed the Future Innovation Labs. Many of you might have known them by the former name of the CRISP, so the Collaborative Research Support Programs. These are now one of the key uh, partnerships that we have within the Feed the Future Research Strategy. There are 24 of these innovation labs uh, across the country. As you can see, they engage over 60 US colleges and universities. They are the heart of our research investments and our capacity building investments, and each of these works on both of those. As they're doing the research, they're, they're training students, they're working with the institutions in the developing countries, and they have real meaningful partnerships with those developing country partners, and they really have a long-standing focus on smallholder farmers. If you look throughout the programs of, of the Innovation Labs and the former CRISPs, you'll see that, that really working with smallholders, both men and women, has been at the heart of what they do. So the first example I'm going to tell you about is, is Africa Rising. It's really our signature sustainable intensification research program anchored in Africa in those three production systems I mentioned. It's complemented by a similar program in South Asia that I, I won't talk about today. And in fact, we've just added to this portfolio of sustainable intensification a new innovation lab focused on sustainable intensification that was just awarded to Kansas State University. So as a side note, that program is actually going to be putting out its competitive RFAs soon. So if you're interested to engage with us in research in this area, look out for announcements from Kansas State on how you might become involved in the research that they're going to be leading, which will really complement the research that I'm going to talk about here under Africa Rising. So it, Africa Rising is a huge project. I could, I could spend all, all afternoon telling you about it, but I'm just going to highlight a few things in here. Um, one is that 
they work through these innovation platforms and what those essentially are are local stakeholders brought into groups to really help identify the key research needs. So the research that the program is doing on farming systems on sustainable intensification is informed by these innovation platforms. This helps ensure that the research is really addressing local priorities but also that the feedback about the technologies and the research is going from those beneficiaries, from the smallholder farmers back to the researchers. So it's a two-way street. And then these innovation platforms can also be used to help strengthen the market linkages to make sure that the production side of things is effectively linked to the, the markets, the aggregators, the processors, bringing in the extension agents and so forth. So it's a real dynamic platform at the field level to engage the smallholders with all the other actors in the, in the value chain. Um, what we have a photo here is of the mother baby trials. This is another way that the, the program engages smallholders is by bringing in smallholders into the research process itself. Many of the research activities are taking place on the farmer's field. So it's a very rich relationship there. Oh, this is one of these guys. Let's see if I can get to the end without going too far. There we go. So this is, this is sort of a complex cartoon that, that is sort of illustrate the different kinds of interventions and research that can happen at the field level. Africa Rising really, um, it takes as its unit of research not an individual farmer's field, but actually the entire farm, the entire household enterprise. And this helps you get at things. There's trade-offs between you might grow maize in your field or you might use an area for livestock or you might want to use your, your leftover stover as fodder, or you might want to integrate it into your, into your field. So there's all these different trade-offs that you can really only get a good sense at if you're working at the entire farm level. But what I wanted to show here was this little basket. You, I don't know if you can read this on the right, but this, this research is essentially about creating options and, and giving smallholder farmers options to choose from. So it's not coming in and saying, here are the package of technologies that you need to use in order to be effective. It's saying these are technologies that we have tested, that we have tried in collaboration with the smallholder farmers, and we know they work, and let's work with you to help figure out what might be best in your farm. Because it's gonna be different um, if you're a single parent, a single mother, perhaps um, with a small piece of land, you're gonna be trying out a different range of options than a large family operation with much more labor on the farm, for example. So this is just an example of, of a farmer that Africa Rising works with, uh, Elizabeth Mindy, a smallholder in Tanzania. She has five children working on a relatively small farm. Um, through working with the project, she was able to pilot test a number of new technologies, ranging from new varieties, different fertilizer or manure approaches, and different intercropping and spacing opportunities. And so she actually tried the maize and the pigeon pea intercropping trials on her farm. And then surrounding farmers were able to come and meet with her and see what she's doing on her farm, learn what her experience is, which was actually quite positive. She did a, a trial essentially on her farm where she left a small part of her farm in her conventional practice. And on the larger part of her farm, she tried out these various new technologies and was really encouraged by the yield increases that, that she got. So, but, but by working with a farmer like, like Elizabeth, who's quite engaged with her community, that, that learning can be transferred and shared with other smallholders in her, in her region. So I mentioned earlier that we're, we're challenged in thinking about how you involve communities and smallholders and women, even in what might appear to be a more upstream science genomics project, that it might be hard to, to make that connection. Through a collaboration with the US Department of Agriculture, the International Livestock Research Institute in Kenya, we're working on a goat genomics project. This is about trying to select better genetics to deal with climate change and to be more productive in, in smallholder systems in Africa. And so there's quite a bit of work going on in the lab on putting together a high quality goat genome assembly, trying to identify genetic variation and signatures of selection. But at the same time, the project is now taking this learning and developing it into community-based breeding programs. And this is working directly with the farmers in a community to give them the tools and the knowledge that they need in order to do selection at their herd level. Um, if you think about a herd of goats, you might be incentivized as a farmer to take the ones that grow most quickly and to sell those off when they're young to increase your income, but that might have a sort of perverse selection um, on your, your herd, and you would essentially be, be weeding out the most productive goats if you did that. So this is about... Um, sort of bringing a different approach and giving smallholders, farmers, the tools that they might themselves need in order 
to, to advance their herd selection at the herd level, at the community level. So that's, that's kind of a neat example of how you can bring that genomics learning all the way down to, to make it useful in the field at the farmer level. Here's another one. So this is one of our innovation labs, the Soybean Value Chain Research Innovation Lab. And they work uh, in Africa um, thinking about whether there's one of their studies here is on whether and how smallholder farmers can really engage in the soybean value chain. I think we think of soy value chains in many places as quite commercial, um, perhaps not where you'd expect a smallholder farmer to be engaging, but there's evidence in Africa that there's some real opportunities there. So the socioeconomics um, portion of the study is really focused on a few questions, trying to understand is soybean appropriate for smallholder farmers? If not, why? And if yes, how can you best introduce it? And what are the gender implications in terms of the decision making and, and who are the beneficiaries in a family? Another, uh, I'll get to this last point on the Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index, but this is a tool that I'll describe later that we're actually using within this project. So here you have a photo of um, the, the researchers engaging with the smallholder farmers during the socioeconomic work, and then you have seed packets here ready for dissemination. This is one part of a much larger project looking across the soy value chain. Um, another part of this project is looking at, at soy milk production, something they're calling Vita Goat, and, and trying to think about how smallholder farmers can engage in soy milk production, how they can get linked to a broader market through this, um, what's the economic sustainability of the, of the soy milk enterprise, and how can they train and engage community-based advisors to really help the women and, and the smallholders who are producing soy milk to, to, to make it into a profitable enterprise so it's not just a household-level enterprise, but it's actually something with, with real potential. So you'll notice here I'm, I'm going through some legume examples. There's no... Um, it's not really a coincidence. I think we've, we have a really strong focus on legumes across our, our Feed the Future research programs. We're recognizing that, that legumes are often a very important income source for women in particular. They often tend to, to grow the legumes. And legumes, of course, are also quite nutritious. And so this helps us get at both our income and our nutrition um, generating goals. And finally, of course, legumes are an important part of sustainable agricultural systems. So as we saw with the, with the farmer in Tanzania, if she's integrating legumes into her maize system, she has the potential to really make it quite a bit more sustainable and productive. So this is an example from our Legume Innovation Lab, which is run by Michigan State University. Um, this particular project is, is run by the University of Illinois and researchers in Niger, and it's focused on integrated pest management in cowpea. And it's this partnership between the university researchers, the, the, the local partners in, in Niger, and NGOs who are working at the household level in Niger. And they've come up with a number of different strategies to address pests of cowpea. And it involves a neem oil mixture and, and a particular virus that, that combat the pests. But what's really important here is they've been able to work with youth in particular and training youth how to use and how to um, produce these, these products. And, and of those youth, they've had 50% girls in a country like Niger, which is impressive. And they're working in multiple villages throughout Niger through these local NGOs. So again, an example of, of really taking an approach and a technology, trying it out at the field level with smallholder farmers and giving them the opportunity to test it in their fields and even to be engaged in the production and the sale of the technology. Another legume example. Um, this is from, from Latin America, another program run by the Legume Innovation Lab out of Michigan State. And it's built on, this is sort of, I think, a nice example to show how the impact pathway goes from research all the way to impacts in the field. This is building on many years of research to develop new bean varieties that are drought tolerant, pest resistant, really suited to the agroecologies in, in Latin America. Um, Bean is a, is a heavy seed. It's, it's not easy to transport. It's self-pollinated. It's very common for farmers to save their own seed. There's not a lot of private sector investment in this market, and the markets themselves are fragmented and poor. And so in addition to the research effort around developing new bean varieties, there was a research effort around actually trying to test out the different models of seed production. Should you do it through community-based production? Is there a way to do it through government system, whatever it is? They tried a number of different approaches, and they came up with using these community seed banks and the community-level seed production as a really viable option for these ecologies for this type of seed. 
And by the end of the project, they had reached over 100,000 smallholders across several countries in Latin America. And at the same time, they were producing and disseminating through these community strategies, the packages of the rhizobia inoculant to go with the seed. So what's really been nice to see come out of this is that our Guatemala mission has now made another investment um, to really ramp up this effort in Guatemala. What we're gonna do there is to integrate not just the seed dissemination through the, the community seed production, but really to integrate that with nutrition messaging around how you might improve the quality of your diet at the household level. So this kind of gets to something else that we're really focused on within Feed the Future, and particularly our research strategy, is how can you get those nutrition outcomes at the household level through agriculture investments? It's not simply enough to help people produce more beans. Maybe they sell them instead of eating them, or maybe they don't have the full range of nutrition information they need level. So we actually have a fair amount of operational research that is focused on specifically that question of how can you align and how can you design your agriculture investments to get those specific nutrition outcomes that are really one of the top line goals of Feed the Future. Um, so now I'm going to shift away from the research into a series of new projects that were just launched, many of them with CGIR partners around scaling technologies. And these are technologies that are ready to go, that have been developed already, perhaps aren't reaching enough farmers for a variety of reasons, or as we often say, they're sort of just sitting on a shelf sometimes. And so this influx of resources and attention is aimed at really trying to think about the best ways to get these technologies out the door. And, and Julie Howard's here. She was, during her time at USAID, really involved in, in, in mobilizing folks in our office behind this and, and getting this entire initiative off the ground. This is an example in Ethiopia, malt, malt barley production. A lot of the examples I'm gonna walk you through are, are seed-based, but in fact, the seeds uh, dissemination is happening at the same time with information on agronomic practices, best practices, how you can link to market. So it's not just a seed effort as it is really thinking about how you empower smallholders to, to adopt a full range of technologies and to themselves figure out what they want to use um, to ensure that, that, that the research outputs are not just sitting on a shelf or in a lab somewhere, but really getting out to scale. So this is just an example of, of um, working with, with farmers to grow a new kind of barley that's particularly suitable for, for the, the brewing industry. And, and in doing so, they actually get quite a bit of a premium of regular barley that they might be growing. Also in Ethiopia, another example of community-based seed production. I think legumes lend themselves really well to community-based seed production, primarily because there's so little, in many places, so little private sector investment that, that you can't just say, well, the private sector will handle seed multiplication dissemination, because that's not happening for a lot of these really critical crops that are important to smallholder farmers. Faba bean is another one we're working through Um, crops to date. I think 10% of the national seed supply in Ethiopia actually is, is, is through community-based seed production. Um, another one, vegetable seed kits with the World Vegetable Center. This is recognizing that vegetables play an important role in, in nutritional and dietary diversity and, and often are an important source of income for farmers as well. So this is an effort to try to increase that year-round access to, to nutritious foods and to, to help farmers, even on very small plots of land at the household level, to, to grow vegetables, different kinds of vegetables, and to give them the intent, access to the entire packet of, of tools they might need, which could include, su include seed, but, but many other things as well. And then finally, one more legume example um, in West Africa, scaling both groundnut and cowpea. Again, two crops that are extraordinarily important to smallholder farmers. A number of new varieties are coming out of the pipeline in groundnut. That's varieties with aflatoxin resistance, shorter duration, drought tolerance. In cowpea, it's striger resistance, higher grain, fodder yield resistance to nematodes or aphids. So it's, it's really, again, this is an effort working with community-based seed production to try to get these varieties to farmers and to help them be engaged in really disseminating and even profiting from the dissemination of these varieties along with the associated tools and, and, and best, best practices that you would need. So now I'm gonna shift again. I mentioned I would come back to gender. Um, when we started Feed the Future, it was clear that we really wanted to be working on gender. It was extraordinarily important for us to, rec you know, we recognized that we were only gonna succeed in as much as we could 
reach smallholder farmers, we could change their access, their decision-making powers on the household, within the household, but we didn't really have a good way of measuring that. How do you know if you're having an impact? Um, all our projects count the number of beneficiaries that are men and women, and that's great, and it's great that we require you to do so if you're one of our grantees, but that doesn't necessarily tell us, are we really changing the status for women? Are we changing dynamics? Are we giving them a level playing field within the agricultural system? So along with, with several other partners, uh, we led the development of something called the Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index. And this tool tracks women's roles and engagement in agriculture, essentially, relative to men. And it's, it's a very quantitative tool that you can use to, to gauge your progress. At, right now, it's, it's being used at the national level or across large areas. And it looks over who make it looks at who makes the decisions, who has access to assets and resources, who controls the use of the income, what are the leadership roles within the community, and how do women and men spend their time? And this is a survey-based tool that we found quite effective, but it's actually now being diversified, and we're using it in different ways. Um, we're we're streamlining a new version of it that can be used in large national surveys, but we're also coming up with versions that can be used at the project level. And I mentioned that the Soy Bean Value Chain Innovation Lab is actually working with that tool at the project level. And, and we're trying to take the, the learning that's come out of um, WIA and gender analysis and really thinking about it from the project design stage, thinking about it as you're building your impact pathways for a new commodity or new project that you're working with, how can you ensure that it's gender sensitive and that you're gonna get those gender income, or sorry, gender outcomes. This is just an example, the Sorghum Millet Innovation Lab using gender analysis in the, in the development of their value chain work. So as the project got off the ground, they got a bunch of folks together. It's a, it's a nice, nice schematic, but it's really thinking about what are the roles of men and women in their value chain. And they're doing this before they've even initiated really any research. It's not after the fact, how are we gonna get this out to women, but it's as we get started, how do we really build this in from the get-go? And then just a last slide to show how we use gender assessment in the program cycle, um, really through design, through implementation, through the monitoring and evaluation phase, and then the assessment and the redesign, and at every step in this process, thinking about what are the impacts, how can we, how can we really ensure that we're getting those impacts that, that, we, that we're trying for, for both smallholder farmers and for women. And that's all I got, thanks a lot. So it's time for question and comments. Uh, so please, uh, anyone, let, let, before you start, let me just ask the first question uh, using my prerogative here. Um, Sahara, uh, I see all the w work which is being done and you gave a very good uh, menu of what's being done under Feed the Future and other programs. My question to you is when you talk to people in sub-Saharan African countries, do you see any lessening of their concern or quote unquote opposition to uh, GMOs, or is that still there? <laughs> I didn't even mention GMOs. How come I'm getting a question on them? <laughs> um, you hear both. I mean, there are farmers who wish they could be growing the existing genetically engineered crops, and they're not able to because their government hasn't yet advanced them through a regulatory system, or there's no one to make them available in a country. You could imagine... Um, something like, like a drought tolerant maize or an insect resistant maize or a BT cotton. Um, and then you also, you hear from farmers that have heard that these crops are gonna be toxic and, and have all sorts of problems. And they're usually hearing them from sources that are not particularly credible. Um, but I think when it really comes down to it, um, the farmers are looking for tools to increase their productivity and profitability and, and you know, they'd be likely to adopt them if they could. Thanks. Um, I was very interested in uh, uh, your technology scaling and your examples of the community-based uh, seed production. Uh, how do you um, um, sort of, of uh, work with the, the private sector to the extent that there is some private sector, I mean, particularly vegetable seeds and things like that, I suspect, and, and how do you <clears throat> sort of build in sort of the evolution of the seed mm -hmm. industry. I mean, in, in a sense, you'd hope that, that, that some of the community-based stuff would eventually lead to, to some women's groups or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, building on the, 
current role that they play in, in multiplying and selling seeds uh, to, to maybe develop their own uh, companies or anyhow to, to, to figure out a way to work mm -hmm. with the, uh, the uh, private seed industry as no, it evolves also? Yeah, no, that's a, absolutely, that's a great question. I think there's a real spectrum. There's gonna be some crops in some places where there simply isn't yet a seed industry of any sort, and that's where you're working through communities. There's gonna be other places where perhaps it's a mix, different kinds of farmers are either gonna reach out to their neighbors or to the private sector. Some crops lend themselves really well, like maize, for example, to really helping to strengthen the local private sector and, and, and doing it that way. I think an example of what you described is in Nepal, where there's been an effort around community seed production for many years, and we're seeing some of those small community groups turn into private enterprises. So that's an evolution that I think is, can certainly play out in some areas and in some crops that lend themselves better to that. You, we'd like to see more of it. So certainly something we're, we're working with. We, I was talking about community seed production in these projects, but there's a, a range of different investments we make into that seed sector. Um, our work with, with Agra in Africa, for example, is working with, with small private seed companies. Uh, thank you very much, Ed Mabaya. Um, my question is, um, in the old model, extension services served as a go between, between research and farmers, where information was flowing one way. In this new model where we bring researchers closer to the farmers, and we're saying that there's a two-way street of information flow, what do you envision as the role of extension, if any at all? And are you funding any extension support work anymore? Or is that an old model? Thank you. Well, I don't, I don't see why the interaction has to be directly always between the researchers and the farmers. I think the extension agents themselves can, can play a role in there. Certainly, um, in a lot of places, there are more extension agents to go around than there are farmers, or sorry, than, than researchers. <laughs> Certainly not than farmers, that would be. <laughs> um, so I think, I think an extension service model that is really um, receptive to and working with farmers as opposed to just conveying information to farmers would play an important role in, in conveying that information back and forth. I think where we've seen um, some really good examples of that, and I, I didn't really talk about South Asia too much, but I mentioned we have a program, the Serial Systems Initiative for South Asia, and it's a bit like Africa Rising, but it, it, it's sort of further along and it's working a lot on, on models of technology transfer and, and community-based sort of innovation platforms. And I think one of the things that project has done is really strengthen and build a new role for those extension systems in the region such that the extension system representatives are actually out there doing joint trials with farmers and themselves being engaged in the research process. Well, once again, thank you for an excellent overview of Feed the Future, and I was particularly pleased to see your emphasis on women in agriculture on the partnership in the innovation labs with the universities, particularly the land-grant universities, and your emphasis on nutrition, the consumption side of, of our work. Um, but earlier today, Jeff Ellers uh, shared some data on consumption, or on price, prices and projected prices and, cons and uh, over a period of what, tw 15 years to 2025, which showed declining commodity prices, and your data, or your first slide, suggested an increase in commodity prices, and that seems to cut to the heart of sustainability for, for our producers, particularly the smallholders. I wonder if you could comment on the discrepancies between your data, Jeff, and your, your slide on commodity prices. Well, maybe Jeff might want to comment since I, I didn't get to see his slide. I'm guessing yours was a projection and mine was to date, or my, I think mine even stopped maybe a year or so ago. So I'm not an economist. I, I probably will just not try to really take a stab at that question. But I think commodity prices have risen today over where they were. Where they're going in the future is, is something we, we look to our economists to give us better information on. Do you want to, do you want to comment or...? Thank you, thank you, Sara. I, I just showed a slide from a World Bank report that was looking out to 2025, and it had probably uh, 30 different basic agricultural commodities, and it was showing for most of them slight declines in prices, so that by 2025, you know, soybeans had fallen from $550 a ton to $510 a ton. And so we were trying to, um, 
you know, match that picture with this big food production issue that was on your first slide. And, and I basically offered it up as a question that I didn't understand the, the apparent uh, lack of linkage between those two numbers. You know, we're, we're facing this huge uh, need to fill you know, a lot of hungry mouths, but at the same time, there must be, the World Bank is figuring there's productive capacity actually greater than today, and that's why food prices are gonna be lower, mm -hmm. they're projecting at least. And now, you know, how accurate, I mean, I, I can't say that the World Bank's always had a perfect record, so, yeah. you know, who knows if that's ever gonna come out, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I take this as, I mean, the World coming. Bank is, has got confidence that everything that we all are doing is going to be so successful that prices are going to come back down. There, right? there you go. They have got a lot of, that's a good way to look at it. Thank you. I'll turn it over. I feel I have to say something about this. I just went to the IFPRI uh, Foresight Conference last Friday, and they have real prices rising in the future. So I think, you know, there are lots of different analyses out there. For us, we know that if technology grows faster, prices won't go up as much, so it's good to keep investing. That's, the, I think, the important message that we need. I, mean, I think, you know, smallholders are both consumers and, and producers, and so th this dynamic is always played out in this debate. If, if you're trying to primarily sell things, you want prices to be high, but if you're also purchasing things, which many smallholders are, then you want them low, so... The big issue for smallholders. Mm -hmm. so yeah. One last question, uh, Chris Beard, if you're in time, otherwise, Ken is going to. Uh, so, uh, any more questions on this side? Yeah, please. Uh, Jeff? So, Hart, in, in your Africa Rising technology packages, um, you know, you said they're, they're, you were going to have an offering, or they're having, they have an offering for maybe different levels of farmers or, or different individual situations. Is there any financial packages that go with those? And, because what I worry about is that, you know, someone who wants to increase their production simply lacks the, you know, the little bit of pre production financing to get into that next level of technology package. So then they opt for maybe one that's not quite as good but is cheaper, and it doesn't really allow them to take that next step up the economic ladder. Yeah. No, that's a good question, and it's certainly something that is part of the mix when you're thinking about transforming and uh, sustainable intensification. It's, it's not just about the biophysical inputs, it's about the financial packages as well. I can't say off the top of my head which of the Africa Rising projects have really integrated that fully or, or to what extent they're thinking about it. It's certainly something that's come up in our South Asia programs as well. And, and through the different partners in, in the region, working with, with other development partners that may be offering finance packages or, or resources, that's certainly something that tr they're trying to integrate. Please join me giving a hand to Sarah. Uh, and Ken, we are right on time, right? Well, again, you should have plenty of questions for the discussion sessions. We're doing something a little bit different now at 2 o'clock. <clears throat> We're going to have those who are funders like Gates and USAID and uh, other foundations. And if you're an innovation lab person like Michigan State or Virginia Tech or Kansas State, stay in this room and be a part of the funders discussion. If you are a researcher or an outreacher or some NGO working on the ground with small holders, uh, we would like for you to go not next door this time, but down to the first level in room 110 uh, for presentations related to working with smallholder farmers. And uh, so we're going to have a chance to get a refreshment. Uh, there's probably some cookies and some sodas and coffee out there. Get it on your way down, and we will continue in the matter of minutes so that uh, we can continue to get your input uh, into this dialogue.